And if anyone has any additional follow-up questions uh, regarding the TIP report, we can uh, try to collect those and get back uh, with you more information. Uh, good afternoon again. The, uh, I want to start with a little bit about the Indian Prime Minister um, and the visit here yesterday. The Indian Prime Minister Modi uh, departed Washington last night after a successful trip to Washington. Uh, he went to the White House, as you all know, at the invitation of President Trump. The President said yesterday, quote, the relationship between India and the United States has never been stronger and has never been better. Secretary Tillerson met with Prime Minister Modi yesterday morning. The two talked about ways to further strengthen our cooperation, particularly in the areas of counterterrorism, defense, and also trade. The Secretary reaffirmed the administration's support for India's role in the, as a leading security provider in the Indo-Pacific region. He also noted that he looks forward to working even more closely with India on shared regional and global priorities, including North Korea. So we thank Prime Minister Modi for coming to Washington. With that, I'll take your questions. Thank you. Um, let's start with the um, uh, the Supreme Court order from yesterday. Okay. Um, I realize that you have 72 hours to actually implement it, and we're only just a little over 24 hours into it. Um, and so I presume that there's still people are still working on it. Good math for a uh, reporter. Implementation. Yeah. yeah, but I couldn't I couldn't subtract. I couldn't tell you <laughs> okay. how much, I don't know how many hours are left. <laughs> um, but what is your understanding of what is the department going to set out a list of criteria for what constitutes a bona fide relationship? Um, with an American entity or person, as the court has said? So uh, a lot of talk and a lot of questions about this term bona fide, and that was something that actually came from this Supreme Court. So as you mentioned, as you correctly mentioned, we have a couple days still to work this out and get more information. So we will be looking to the Department of Justice to get more clarification on what a bona fide relationship will be. Right, but do you expect that you will lay at this, that you and your guidance to visa issuing posts will be laying out, okay, uh, a, 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 like a, a second cousin twice removed is not bona fide or is bona fide right. or, uh, you know, a hotel reservation I, I is would, a I would anticipate relation. that we would have to give certainly um, some degree of explanation uh, and a definition to our folks who are handling this overseas exactly what that terminology will look like. That we don't know yet, so that's why we'll continue to chat with the Department of Justice and our folks over there, people here, are hard at work with Department of Justice and also, I believe, Homeland Security to try to figure out exactly what this term bona fide should mean and will mean, and then we'll get that information out to our folks across the world. And do you have any idea of the time? I mean, could it, I, I realize you have until Thursday, yeah. but could it come earlier? I mean. You know, the, this is obviously an important matter and a big matter, and everybody wants to get this right. They want to see this implemented in an orderly uh, fashion. And so in doing that, I think they'll probably take their time, as much time as they have, to make sure they get it right so that we can get that information and then get that out to our folks overseas. And we know that our people at the State Department have a lot of questions about this as well, legitimate questions, just as all of you do, too. So who, who's, Hi. I mean, at the point of entry, how is it enforced? Because the first time around, it caused a great deal of chaos, mm -hmm. if, you, if you remember. Now, how is it going to be enforced? Is it left to the discretion of the customs officers or the immigration officers yeah. at the point of entry? I think, I think some of that we just don't know yet. We need additional guidance from the Department of Justice. So some of these questions, important questions that you all have, I'm just not going to be able to answer today because this is all still in flux and the lawyers are going through it. And you know, lawyers get involved. And they like to go through all the language and all the words. So uh, some of that I'm just going to have to wait uh, until they can give us greater guidance on that. Hi, right, Felicia. Hi. Hey. Um, and let's stay on this e uh, oh, on the executive order before we okay, go over to other come things. Come back to me later. Okay. okay. So Hi, Michelle. I don't know how, you know, what the scope is of what you do know, but in terms of refugees coming in and this relationship, mm -hmm. if they've had contact with a resettlement agency or a church group or something, are you – prepared to treat that as a bona fide relationship? Like, or, or is that one of the things you, you haven't hashed out yet? So uh, a couple things. Bona fide relationship, we don't have a definition here at the State Department for that yet. None of the agencies has that definition just yet. That we will be working to get. That I anticipate will take a couple days to get that. However, I can tell you in terms of refugees who are already slated to be coming here, we have been in touch with them. By that I mean uh, we have advised our refugee resettlement partners overseas that they should currently proceed with the resettlement of refugees who are scheduled to travel to the United States through July the 6th. 
beyond July the 6th. We are not totally certain how that will work because, again, this is in flux, this is in progress, this is a new development, as the Supreme Court just spoke to this yesterday. Um, there is a number of 50,000, as you all know, that is the 50,000 cap. We expect to reach that cap within the next week or so. We are somewhere in the neighborhood of close to 49,000. Not exactly 49,000, but something close to that. So you know that the ruling addresses that cap and, and says that it you know, for certain people with that relationship, it would go beyond. Correct. So refugees with bona fide ties, which we're still working on that definition, will not be subject to that cap. But I just wanted to mention that and lay that out about the uh, 50,000 arrivals. Okay. I Hi. believe the number, you, I think you, should, you have hit 49,000, just in, okay. like in the last two hours. In the last couple? Of, okay. Good, Matt. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Hi. How are you? When you do define sort of what a bona fide relationship is, is that something? Again, that won't be our definition. We'll sure. be working with the Department of Justice. They'll make that designation and determination, and then we'll we'll follow through with it. Sure. In terms of like um, informing the consular officers, mm -hmm. um, that of course uh, we would be we expect that that to happen. But in terms of um, also publicizing to potential immigrants, people who are applying for visas, is that something that you plan to make public so that they don't kind of spend the money or whatever it might be to yeah. make the application? Uh, you know, one thing I think that the State Department is good at doing is putting up uh, lots of stuff on the website, um, but also just getting information out to the general public. We want travelers or prospective travelers to know exactly what they may or may not be facing, so we'll get that information out. So does the State Department share the concerns of three justices that this could be a burden and a problem for the State Department? Uh, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Anything else on this matter? Lori, do you have something on uh, the EO? We're done with EO. Okay, let's go on to something else then. Okay, Syria. Um, uh, sure, let's go on to Syria. Um, so the Russians put out a readout of a call yesterday between uh, Secretary Tillerson and Foreign Minister Lavrov. In the Russian version of the call, it, it says that they discussed deterring the use of chemical weapons. Did the Secretary they discuss the what? Deterring the use of chemical weapons okay. in Syria. Did the Secretary? Uh, share information. Share the information that was shared with us last night. That that they had that the U.S. has detected preparations at the site. And did the secretary warn uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov about that, or ask them to press the Russia, uh, the Syrians not to do that? Well, I, I can confirm that uh, Secretary Tillerson spoke yesterday. Uh, with his counterpart, uh, with Mr. Lavrov, the foreign minister there. Uh, as you know, they talk about things regularly. They uh, began their dialogue in Moscow in, I believe it was March. Uh, they met here uh, about a month ago or so, um, and then, of course, they've had subsequent phone conversations, such as the one last evening. Um, Secretary Tillerson um, is not putting out a full play-by-play -play of that conversation. Uh, we know that the Russians have put out what they consider to be their version, so I'm not going to get into a tit-for-tat about uh, what we think they said or what they claim they said, you know, claim was said in that conversation, but the Secretary uh, has made his concerns clear in the past and continues to do so with regard to Russia. In light of the statement that the White House put out last night, it mm -hmm. seems like a fair question to ask. If Oh, I'm not, you, you can ask me anything you want. I'm not saying but it's you're not. not. You're not going to say anything specifically <laughs> no. about chemical weapons. Go to Sparrow carrying one pound coconut. Um, did you? Are you saying that you? Uh, are you saying that you dispute the Russian characterization? I, I, no, I'm just. I'm not going to get into a tit for tat. The Russians will often put out information, and they tend to mischaracterize things sometimes. Um, and so I'm not going to get into, you know, going back and forth with them about uh, what was said in this conversation. Secretary Tillerson is always clear uh, with the Russians about um, how we feel about certain things, and uh, the Secretary prefers to conduct a lot of his dis diplomacy in private in those conversations because he believes that we can be most effective that way. Uh, there, okay, is some report, there were some reports uh, that the White House statement about the Syria chemical weapons attack took some policy experts at the State Department by surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, is that true? It was the State Department, you know, fully read in on this? So the Secretary, as you know, was at the White House yesterday. He met with the President, uh, also a group meeting with the President's national security team, and that's when this conversation was all had about that statement. So they were all informed and aware of that statement in terms of, you know, who exactly that filtered down to at the State Department. I'm not going to get into our internal conversations, but the Secretary was aware of it. Folks here were aware of it, and that's what's important and that's what matters. 
So the of time. The, the Tillerson Lavrov call came before the, the, the statement. I believe made by, um, by that's the a good question. Hats, I believe right? the Secretary's call with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was in the morning. I can double check on that and get back with you, but yes, okay. So yeah, it was in the morning. Not have come as a result of that. You know, again, I, I just I just don't know, but the call as I'm getting the nod over here was in fact in the morning. Sir, hi. How are you? Yes. Uh, there is clearly a difference of opinion or I don't know. Uh, strong disagreement, whatever you might want to call that, between Russia and the United States over this matter. Uh, the Syrians themselves claim that there is no preparation underway for any chemical weapons attack. Russia seems to be agreeing with them. Oh, oh, wait, oh, hold on. Are we supposed to buy what the Syrians are saying, that there are no chemical weapons this preparations underway? Question. Because in the past, we know that they have killed their own people, which include women and children. So if they say that they're not making any preparations, I'm not certain that we're going to buy that. Well, there but is no ahead. agreement on that either. You Pardon know, me? There, uh, there is no agreement on that either. There was no... Uh, to your in, question. I'm sorry? Just what's the question? Go, go ahead, sir. Uh, I Please. wanted to ask you something else. Yes, go right ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask you if there is a follow, if, if there is an intent to follow up on that uh, between on Secretary. Which? I'm, I'm sorry. On the discussion on Syria and uh, alleged uh, plans for chemical attack between Secretary Tillerson and Minister Lavrov. You mean, you, are, do you mean that uh, when the statement was put out last evening that the United States is concerned about Syria and preparations? that we believe are underway for a chemical weapons attack. Your question is, will there be additional conversations about that? Yeah, something like I, that. I don't have any additional calls or any information to read out. Um, this is something that the United States government we remains uh, very concerned about. I'm just not aware of any any subsequent conversations that are scheduled just yet. Can, can you say, did, did, I know you don't want to get into the details, but is there any effort to get the Shannon Ryabkov uh, meetings channel that open again. So we, is that we would that regard that conversation as a very important conversation to be had. You all have heard it here that our um, relationship with the Russian government is at a low point right now, and we would like to fix that so we can find areas of common interest, such as the fight against ISIS. Um, so that we can find those areas of common interest and work on those fully together. I know we would like to resume those conversations with the Russians about that. Um, I don't have any meetings or any trips to read out about that. But I'll, no, I'm I'll just wondering if there's something the Secretary talked to Foreign Minister Lavrov about, if there's something that, um, among the menu of, of agenda that I they know had, we talked that, about a lot of mutual areas of concern regarding rescheduling that meeting. That I just don't know. Um, anything else on uh, Russia right now? Syria, Syria, Russia? Iraq. Oh, hold on. Russia, Syria? Syria. Oh, how are you? Do you guys have any evidence to share with us about this potential um, preparation for the use of chemical weapons? Because that wasn't actually laid out. Right. And, and, and nor would that be laid out because that would be considered an intelligence matter. So as you all are aware, there are a lot of these things that will um, pop up sometimes that we just can't get into the details about this. But this has obviously gotten the attention of the United States government at the highest level. So could the activity have perhaps been for some other reason than a chemical weapons attack preparation? Such as? Something that they do at the base or, mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that a possibility? I would say that that's a hypo hypothetical question. Um, we know from past experience that the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons on its own people. Um, so that obviously remains a very, uh, a very large concern for us in the future. I just want to make a yeah. point of clarification. Yeah. When you guys believe that it's in your interests, you do put out what you say is evidence or proof of things that involve intelligence. And it happened from this podium not mm -hmm. that long ago with the crematorium that you mm -hmm. guys said was being mm -hmm. built at the prison. Yeah. So it's not a blanket. We never discuss intelligence, right? Matt Lee. I, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into that one with you. But this is uh, a very serious and grave matter. And when you have the president involved and his national security team and the secretary involved as well, I'd say that's a serious issue. 
Okay. Any, anything else on this? Hi. How are you? Go ahead. Let him go ahead. I'm sorry. The preparation. The preparation. Is it like 24 hour preparation, maybe 48 hours, and then they stand back? I don't, I don't have the answer to that question. The White House may be able to give you more on that, or perhaps the Department of Defense or another agency, but um, our department rather. Uh, but I, I just can't get into that, and I don't have the answer to that question. Just to clarify, um, Mr. Assad was also seen photographed with the top Russian general in Syria within the last 24 hours or so. Do you know if the Russians, or are, are we aware if the Russians were aware about these uh, preparations as well? I, I, I'm not aware of that. Um, we don't have any intel saying one way or another. I, I just can't get into any intelligence, but I'm, I'm not personally aware of that. Okay. Anything else on uh, Russia, Syria? Uh, hold on. Russia, Syria? Okay. Who's got it? Uh, sir, uh, in the back. Yeah, so Ambassador Haley said today that they would blame Iran, Russia, and Syria if chemical weapons were, again, what does it mean to blame these countries? How would the U.S. hold them accountable in the event of another strike? Okay. Does the U.S. intend on militarily striking Iran or Russia in the event of a chemical weapons attack? Okay, your third question I can't answer. That's a Department of Defense uh, matter, and then that's also a hypothetical. In terms of the first question, which is why would we, uh, why would we look to Syria so and how, Iran? Is what does it mean? Point? What does it mean to blame them? Well, we've seen all we have to do is look to the past, right? And we have seen as the Syrian regime back in 2015 was on the verge of collapsing. Who came in to help save the Syrian regime? Who came in? Russia came in. And that is exactly why we are today, we meaning the world, in uh, the place that Syria is. Russia came in, helped bolster up Syrian uh, Syrian forces, and we have seen the death, the devastation, the destruction that has taken place ever since. So when we say uh, Russia would be held responsible, we believe that they play a role in this as well. They have a lot of influence with the Assad regime, and we have consistently called upon them to use their influence with the Assad regime to stop this kind of um, to stop this kind of activity. Just, uh, John topic, uh, you know, Her remarks that any attacks on the Syrian people, you know, would, will be blamed, you know, on the Assad and the Russians. Okay. Uh, why not? wait to find out. This is obviously a complex war with a right. number of actors, yeah, right. including ISIS. Uh, it seemed like a rather unnuanced comment. Of what, wouldn't you find out who exactly you know, was responsible well, for blaming? I can't get too much into uh, what Ambassador Haley said on the Hill today. I don't have all of her comments in front of me, so I just have to refer you to the U.S.-UN for additional um, uh, clarification on well, what she She meant. actually said that last night in okay. a tweet. Okay. As well as saying it again on the okay. Hill. Can you, are you, yeah. Wouldn't, I mean, the State Department would, in the United States government, would look to find out and make sure it had evidence of who was exactly responsible, right, before issuing a blanket blame for attacks on the Syrian people. Uh, I think right? her comments stand for themselves. Sorry. Okay. Does that mean that you're not going to answer any questions about what she said on the Hill today? Because I got one. I, I, oh, I know you do. I know you do. Go right ahead. <laughs> Why don't you ask that question? I'm going to do my level best because okay. um, I was not aware of, uh, and I know what you're getting at. Well, I'll let you go ahead and ask, and we'll go there. there. So go Ambassador right Haley said that it was a matter of U.S. policy to oppose Palestinians for U.N positions, and she did this answering questions about the reason to, that you guys blocked Salam Fayed from becoming mm -hmm. the, the, the representative for Libya. Is that is that correct? Is it, it, if it's true, it sounds as though it's a, you know, it's a discriminatory. I'm uh, working to get Ambassador Haley's full comments in front of me. I just learned of those comments as I was walking into the briefing room, so didn't have uh, a full amount of time to be able to look into exactly what she said and what was intended by that. So some of this, as you all know, is developing, and when it's developing, I know you want answers right away. I understand that. I'm not always going to be able to give you answers. I'd rather be right than be fast. Sure. Um, we will take a close look at her comments. Uh, we will work to determine exactly uh, what Ambassador Haley meant, but I can tell you this. Ambassador Haley uh, talked about this back in February when the United States expressed its objection to the appointment of Mr. Fayed as the UN's envoy to Libya. That's what we're talking about. We expressed that. She expressed that again in her Hill testimony. And uh, she's talked about this a lot. She believes that the United Nations, and, and many believe that the United Nations needs to be reformed, that for far too long the United Nations has been unfairly biased in favor of the Palestinian Authority to the detriment of our allies in Israel. I know that's a concern of hers. She's talked about that a lot. She's talked about reforming the United Nations. 
But in terms of her comments, I'm just going to need a little bit of time to take a closer Well, let me just add, add one on there. Okay. First of all, I don't understand how this is in any way uh, bias against Israel to appoint a, a well-known, uh, you know, respected financial guy and diplomat to be the envoy to Libya. Mm -hmm. I don't see how that has anything to do with bias against Israel at all. But secondly, I mean, she said that until Palestine is a state, that mm -hmm. this is the policy. So I'm just curious, do you have, a, if this is a policy, does it also apply to the Vatican? Because the, the Palestinians right now have the same status at the UN as, as, as the Vatican does. So if you're going to be consistent about this, then you would, you would, you would oppose any any, any representative of the Holy See taking a UN position Matt, I'm just well. not going to so get in, a, again, to characterizing that right now. I understand your question. I understand your concerns. Let me get some additional information. And anybody has questions, I will do my level best to get you the answers. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. Just a couple more questions. Go ahead. Wait. Very quickly. Okay. Say now, by uh, Israeli press account, the meeting between Mr. Kushner and Mahmoud Abbas yeah. when did not go very well. And they're saying that uh, Basically, that administration is going to pull out of any ongoing process or potential process. Do you have any comment on that? I, I do. Uh, this is something that I was involved with and on the phone with. Um, I, I was not there. But on the phone with over the weekend, uh, hearing from some of the folks who had been traveling uh, with Mr. Kushner um, and Mr. Greenblatt as well. And, and that's just false. Um, the president has made Israeli-Palestinian peace uh, one of his top priorities. You know that. We've talked about that. We understand and recognize that this is not going to be a one-shot deal. It's not going to be handled in, in one meeting or one trip. Um, it is no surprise also that some me meetings and conversations may be a little bit more difficult than others. Some will be more challenging. Uh, the President has said himself that it is not going to be an easy process, that both sides, the Israelis and the Palestinians, will have to give a bit in order to uh, be able to get to uh, a peaceful arrangement, which we hope to see, but we are not pulling out in any way, shape, or form of this as being one of our priorities. Okay? Uh, Cutter. Okay. Okay, so about a week ago you said um, we're left with a simple question. Were the actions of the other countries versus Qatar mm -hmm. really about their concerns regarding Qatar's alleged support for terrorism, or were they about the long simmering grievances between them and the GCC countries? So now that you've seen the list of demands. I can't believe that was only a week ago. Doesn't that feel like it was a month ago? <laughs> um, I guess. It does, yeah. So now that you've seen the list of mm -hmm. demands, do you have a any more light on what the answer to that question is? Yeah, the, the only thing I can say about the exact demands, because I don't want to characterize the demands, but some of them will be difficult for uh, Qatar to uh, incorporate and to try to adhere to. That's as far as I'm going to go in, in saying that. Uh, we. Months? Nope, I can't. <laughs> but some of, them, some of them will be challenging for that country. Um, so what, what would you say the goal is of the, of the meetings today? So the Secretary will have two meetings today. I'm not sure if you're aware of both of them, but he'll meet with the Foreign Minister of Qatar, and then he'll meet with the Foreign Minister of Kuwait. And Kuwait has um, really done a lot of hard work in terms of trying to bring the nations together uh, so that they can come to, an, so that they can come to uh, some sort of agreement. We continue to call on those countries to work together and work this out. And this process is not over yet. They will be having these conversations. Uh, we certainly know for the rest of the week, uh, if not longer than that. And we will we stand by in order to help facilitate some of these conversations. But there's not a set goal, a specific goal for the meeting today, especially with Qatar, like to, 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 to finalize a response or something like that? Not that I am aware of. Um, this meeting starts in 20-some uh, minutes. And so I'm going to have to head up there so I can go into that bilateral meeting. But if there's something that I can share with you, I certainly will. Uh, I, I get you. that you don't want to characterize the demands as, but when you say that you, re you realize that some of them will be difficult for Qatar mm -hmm. to meet, mm -hmm. that implies that you think that they should meet them. I don't think so. No? No. So you think that there's a way, there's some kind of middle ground, there's room for, for negotiation, not with you guys, but between the parties, so that maybe some or parts of some are completed and, and, and maybe other parts are not? Uh, these nations are going to have to work out their disagreements. I mean, we've talked about how a lot of these are long simmering tensions. We believe that they're going to have to work them out. They're best worked out with the countries themselves. Um, we are, are pleased and happy that uh, Kuwait has stepped in to help be a mediator of sorts, and we're happy to stand by 
and assist as we can, but we still feel that they can work them out themselves. But you don't necessarily think that they have to be, all of them have to be met as was delivered in that Matt, I, I, that's for the countries to work out that's not for me to say and I don't, I don't know that that's for the State Department to to weigh in at that level because ultimately these parties have to live with the decisions and the agreements that they make okay last last question uh, yeah. yesterday Iraqi Prime Minister Abadi announced that ISIS defeat was close at hand and so what are your plans how is the the liberation of Mosul once it's liberated which will be soon how is that going to change what you're doing in Iraq? What are your plans for the future of that area? Well, they wouldn't be our plans for the future of the area. It would be the Iraqi government's plans. Um, there's a government of Iraq, so the government of Iraq can decide uh, how they want to govern themselves and what will take place in, um, certainly in certain areas. Our focus right now is on the liberation of Mosul. Um, the Iraqi Prime Minister talked about how he believes that this will be done uh, uh, sooner rather than later. I'm not going to characterize a timeline. Our uh, U.S. forces and coalition partners and the Iraqi government are out there hard at work to try to get ISIS out of the uh, remaining parts of Mosul. There's a lot of work left to be done. Um, there's also, we have also had some successes, and when I say we, I mean the Iraqis coalition and the United States government, in bringing a lot of people back to Mosul in the safer parts where we've gotten ISIS out, and now some of those people have been able to come back in. I think the latest numbers are somewhere around 300,000, but Matt can oh, probably Matt can probably chime in better on those numbers. Um, so uh, the priorities in those areas, working with the government of Iraq to do demining, um, that is one of the major priorities that the U.S. government is involved with as our coalition partners, uh, to bring water, food, electricity. Some schools are back now in session in eastern Mosul. We're not talking, you know, in the, in the tougher parts where ISIS is really dug in in western Mosul, but in eastern Mosul. And that's really a success story as we see it, because if you have children who are able to go back to school right now, not long after ISIS had, was really dug into that area, that is a success and a real testament to the hard work that the Iraqis and our coalition partners have done as well. Uh, do you have any suggestions for political changes in the area, political reform? We wouldn't have any, I don't think we would have any suggestions for that. Um, there's the government of Iraq and the government of Iraq can best decide. Okay. All right, last question. One on, oh, one on. Is Ambassador Coppage staying in a role, it, and is that an important role that needs to be filled at this department? You've got 67 odd special envoys and and representatives that this department or in this administration in particular has said needs to be whittled down substantially, if not entirely eliminated. She got a job at next month, and if so. And if not, is somebody else going to fill that role? I, I don't know the answer to that. Ambassador Coppage and I talked, um, spent some time together last week and spent some time together today. And our focus was really solely on the TIP report and getting that out and getting the information out. So I didn't have a chance to ask her what her career plans are. But uh, if I can find out for you and let you know, I certainly will. But she did a terrific job in putting this together. Is it an important together. role to, to fill at this department, I, even if it's not her? This, uh, the TIP report has been ongoing for, what is it, how many, you, you all have been covering the State Department for a long time, 18 years, 18 years? 17 years, there we go. Um, so I would see that as, as an important matter. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay, last question. Uh, Senator Corker sent a letter yesterday to Secretary Tillerson mm -hmm. threatening to block future arms sales to Gulf nations. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the negotiation process? Does it help or hurt? Um, I, I wouldn't characterize it either way. We're aware of that letter. That letter um, came here into the department, and there's a lot that's going to happen this week, I think. Um, there are a lot of conversations left to be had. Um, about to step into one right now, so I just don't want to get ahead of some of those conversations. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Peter Gage. You want to ask a question? You guys have a question? Uh, <laughs> 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 